Hey everyone, uh, welcome to NTX Inno's virtual state of innovation event. Um, before we kick things off, a few things I want to let you all know about. Um, first off, thanks for everyone for tuning in and to our panelists for joining us. Um, secondly, if you're joining us uh, virtually, you are on mute. So if you have any questions that come up during the conversation, please drop those in the chat box and uh, we'll get to those um, towards the end of our discussion here. Um, so, like I said, thank you guys for tuning in uh, to our State of Innovation event, Launching and Scaling in a Crisis. Um, today, we're going to be talking with the founders who have launched businesses during the pandemic. Um, whether that is delayed dates for them or accelerated things, we're going to be talking about the effects, pressures, and potentials that the pandemic has had for local startups. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with NTX Inno and what we do, um, Inno is a part of a growing network of sites. We're currently in 14 markets, with North Texas being the newest one. We actually celebrated our Innoversary about uh, in uh, September, um, and we're committed to covering and connecting the local technology, startups, growth, and innovation scenes here. Um, and like I said, we're so glad to have you guys here uh, today. And so uh, we would also like to know um, if this is your first Inno event, we're going to be uh, putting a poll in the chat box, which looks like it just showed up. So uh, please, uh, please submit to that. We'd love to, uh, to know. And uh, again, if this is your first event, thanks for joining us. Um, so again, NTX Inno, we cover the local startup and technology ecosystem with daily stories, a daily newsletter, um, called The Beat, which you should all definitely be signed up for. Uh, quarterly events like this, which are obviously virtual for now. Um, you can check us out at ntxno.com to see what we're all about and sign up for the daily newsletter, The Beat. Um, really, The Beat's the best way to stay plugged into everything that's going on and impacting the local innovation economy. Um, in it, you'll get local tech and startup news you need, analysis you won't find anywhere else, info on upcoming events around the region, and cool job openings and much more all in a fun conversational manner like we're having right now. Um, and so before we introduce our panelists here, uh, I want to thank our founding partners, UT Dallas, Accenture, Thomson Reuters, and BDO. Without them, uh, these events would not be possible. Um, and so without further ado, let me, uh, actually, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to uh, introduce themselves and a little bit about their companies. Uh, Chrissy, you're the first up on my screen here, so why don't you start things off? Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to be talking about Pedal. This is actually my first um, panel as an executive for Pedal. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I am the executive vice president for social impact at Pedal. I'm also a co-founder. And Pedal is the world's first zero odor germ freezing waste bin. Um, and uh, we're right now doing a pre-sale event for it. Um, so I'm sure I'll have a lot more to tell you about it uh, as we go on, but that's me in a nutshell. Andrew, you're, uh, you're next up on my screen if you want to take it away. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Andrew Levi, founder and CEO of PlantTag, located in Dallas, Texas. Um, PlantTag is an artificial intelligence-driven technology platform that helps residential gardeners care for all the plants that they own. Uh, we partnered with Texas A&M, uh, AgriLife Extension, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, Eagle View, and um, we've got a, a team of global horticulture experts to help us uh, deliver the most accurate scientific data that help people with the challenging problem of caring for plants. Awesome. And last but not least. Yes. Hello. My name is Stephen Lewis. I'm with Home Match X. I am in the real estate space with technology. So we created Home Match X which is a, a platform that connects buyers and sellers together for a future transaction. You know, I like to call it online dating for real estate. The whole, po the whole focus really is to connect buyers and sellers together based on common interests and timeline. So regardless of the opportunity of the, the ability to transact, we connect you together at that moment of time. Awesome. Um, so Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm, this should be a, a pretty good discussion here. Obviously, uh, the event is, you know, launching and scaling in a crisis. So I, I want to kind of start things off by asking a question to all of you guys. Um, you've all recently launched a, a company or a product. Um, and so I guess 
how has the uh, the pandemic impacted that launch? Has it created new challenges, opportunities? Has it accelerated or delayed things that you originally had planned? I guess just in general, how has it affected your original plans for launch? Um, and I guess we can just go in the, the same order that we introduced ourselves here. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely presented some challenges, um, but it's also had some surprising opportunities along with it. Um, so, you know, some of the challenges are obviously, you know, we, we can't see our team members in person very easily. Uh, we're all dispersed across the country and working virtually. Um, so, you know, culturally, I think if you're starting out a company, um, it helps to be in the same room with people and to be able to, you know, interact with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but we've, we've managed to develop a tight team culture despite, which is very lucky. Um, in terms of uh, opportunities, uh, one of the interesting things about our product is, you know, when we when we first envisioned this concept of a germ freezing waste bin, uh, there was no global pandemic. So we were really struggling with how do we educate consumers about the importance of freezing potentially hazardous waste, you know. Um, now with the pandemic, we don't need to educate people about why that's important. Um, so any type of organic waste, you know, whether it's diapers or uh, masks or other medical waste, that carries along with it um, viruses and other germs. People get that now, um, so uh, we we don't have to overcome that challenge. Um, and the other thing I think that's been interesting is because there's been such a decrease in, for instance, live sporting events, um, concerts, uh, things that would normally be taking up a lot of advertising space, um, the, the cost of online ads has gone way down. Um, and so that's been very beneficial for us because we're launching um, from our website and doing this pre-sale event. And the only way um, that we're speaking to people is digitally. Um, so, and then, oh, the other thing is, um, you know, people now are so used to doing online shopping. Um, everybody is shopping online because they are not wanting to go out into stores and be in contact with, with other people as much. Um, so that has actually been um, an opportunity for us as well. So it's been a very interesting, there have been very interesting highs and lows. Yeah. And uh, Andrew, how is, uh, how is your launch journey gone? Well, Having done a couple of startups, I, I can tell you, timing is everything, and the luck factor has to find you along the way. And you know, I, I couldn't have been luckier in our launch because what's happened with uh, the pandemic is it's caused people to spend a lot of time at home, and the interest in gardening and plants is off the charts. I mean, it's 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 at a peak that it's never been. It hasn't, yeah, it's at a peak that it hasn't been at um, in our lifetime. And so, some people are getting back to their roots. Uh, they might have grown up with grandparents and relatives that spent a lot of time gardening and, and caring for their plants, or it's also bringing a new demographic into the space, too, that are, are developing a newfound appreciation for how cool uh, gardening and plants. And, you know, it, it helps the, the, the movement towards a green environment and a green world that, um, you know, has really gained a lot of interest in momentum and traction. Um, as of recent. So it's it's kind of been a, a natural thing that has been lucky for us. We started working on the data and the science behind what is plant tag uh, several years ago, but our, our launch didn't happen until um, really at the beginning of the pandemic. And so um, it, it's really been good for us. But, you know, I'm going to echo what Christy says, you know, it's uh, there's nothing like being face to face with, um, you know, with, with people that are, are on the journey with you, especially when you're a startup. Chemistry is everything. And so you know, having markers in your hand in front of a whiteboard to solve problems in real time with smart people, you know, it's it's possible via Zoom, but uh, it's just not the same. Um, you know, the other thing too is if you're, you know, if you're selling products to, to buyers, whether it's B2B or B2C, um, you know, there's a lot of value being face-to-face. -face. And so, you know, the downside and unexpected piece of this for us has been that, you know, our primary, our primary customer, our, our revenue generation comes through relationships with independent garden centers. And so, you know, the good thing for the independent garden centers is that their business has been off the charts. So good for them selling lots of plants, but getting any mind share from them, it's been really tough. 
So, um, you know, it, it's it, it's just a you know different challenge, and you know, with startups, you adapt and you pivot, and you know, you figure out how to you know how to find your way in the world. So, I, I would say net net, it's super super good for our launch. Uh, what about you? Yeah, uh, well, the the real estate industry. I mean, once it once we really had the hard hit of the pandemic, and which is when our company, you know, we launched just right before that, and we felt it. And so the market really just in April, you just saw with the housing market, you know, it went down, and that has a lot to do with the uncertainty of you know, can we go out and, and shop for real estate or can we, you know, even, you know, visit the homes where we know it could be a possibility of, you know, transferring or contracting, you know, uh, information, you know, uh, for for just that particular buyer. And then obviously what's the what's the determination of capturing, you know, uh, you know, some form of, you know, virus in the process. And so what happened is it slowed down the market. But shortly after that, come June and, and really July, you start to see where the market increased. And so because we are driven in the real estate housing market, connecting that future buyer to that future seller, you know, we had to pivot. And the last time we spoke, Kevin, uh, you we said, well, how can we create a an opportunity where buyers and sellers can create a humanistic connection together? And at that moment, we said we wanted to launch our live streaming, you know, access, which give buyers and sellers the ability to connect, you know, face to face within the digital space of our platform. And so we wanted to provide a, a, a less invasive process to where, you know, you can feel comfortable about getting a tour inside of a home by that particular seller that's giving you that home tour. And that buyer is on the other screen, getting that information, asking questions, from the seller to get a, a stronger interest of potentially buying that house. And so we really pivoted to that live streaming humanistic connection between that buyer and that seller. Well, then you have it to where we are uh, now, we're in a situation where we're not seeing a lot of inventory in the market space, you know, and so people are, you know, are less, uh, I, I like to say less confident about finding the actual home that they'll be you know, that they really want because we don't really have a lot of inventory now, and that's because a lot of people are really waiting for you know maybe the, the after the election or they're waiting for you know 2021 as things slow down and there's still uncertainty obviously with the job market which allows someone to think about when they can purchase a, a property, but the new construction industry has seen an uptick and that interest of uh, people going after that new construction. And so what we end up doing, uh, we created an opportunity where we wanna, br we wanna bring real estate agents to the, to the forefront of our platform, which gives them the ability to become on agents who are on demand. And what I like to say is when someone need a particular service or a particular job or a task that a real estate agent can perform, they can utilize our platform to hire that subject matter export to perform that task. And so that's what we did, which is very unconventional in the real estate space. So I'm excited about, uh, it's called Realty Card, which is an a la carte service for real estate. So I'm excited about what the, what we have led uh, our platform to be, to really evolve into, which is uh, this whole a la carte model, given that humanistic connection of live stream. And you can really just pick up the phone or, provide a service share that you need a service request done uh, for this particular property that you've already talked to that seller and you know that that seller wants to sell to you without ever hitting the real estate market. So my audio is cutting out. So if, I, if I'm like awkwardly pausing, it's because I can't hear some some of what's going totally on. Totally fine. I, I just realized I was on mute. Uh, oh, no, oh, I okay. guess uh, it's, like, it's my. Yeah, no, it's, it's not you. It's, it's, it's totally my uh, technical okay. abilities here. Uh, kind of going off what you're saying, some of the trends that the pandemic has had on your industry. Obviously, kind of the other big topic of conversation right now is about you know social and racial justice and equality 
Um, last time we spoke, we talked a little bit about kind of how the humanistic social aspect of the app kind of fits into that. But I was wondering if you could kind of, you know, touch on how do you see Home Match X kind of fitting into that conversation of, um, you know, kind of bridging, bridging gaps between people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. So one one thing that this platform really brings to the forefront is that we're we're all human, right? We we have the ability to create and evolve our relationship. Um, one of the things that we don't do enough of in real estate is really take time to get to know that other person that's getting ready to buy your property. We talk a lot about what if there's a way to create a a, a world where we're out having a beer with the seller that we just bought the property from. You know, we're not necessarily meeting. Uh, we're not just stopping that transaction when we get ready to close and have the keys. We're saying, you know what, maybe there's some 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 relationship establishment that we can connect together on. And so we're going out and realizing that, hey, I have a house to sell, but, you know, I, I would love to connect with you even more on a on a more intimate level, you know, if given the opportunity. And we're talking a lot about how millennial buyers are coming to the process of buying real estate. And millennial buyers, they want to be able to connect and have a conversation with people. And, you know, in this time that we're in right now, we don't do enough of, right now we have a digital connection, which is which is where the norm fits into this, this current climate right now. And so the ability to utilize this platform as a way to get to know individuals, you know, on a uh, on a really uh, you know deeper level, and realize that we have so much in common that we have uh, than we have just really from a disconnect. And so grabbing our interests together and realizing how we can play on each other's strengths can really form a a friendship and a relationship down the line. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Christy, I, last time we talked, um, you know, we spoke a little bit about some of kind of the, you know, uh, impacts that Pedal could have kind of in terms of composting um, and sustainability. I guess, like, as you're kind of growing this company out, I guess, like, where do you kind of see that fitting into other, you know, impacts? And I guess just like, how are you planning on on, on building that out? Yeah, so, um you know, a lot of people don't want to compost because there are a lot of nuisances associated with it. Things like fruit flies, ants, foul odors, pets and children, you know, getting in there and taking stuff out. Um, so our product really reduces or eliminates actually all of those nuisance barriers. And so we're, what we're hoping is that estates, municipalities um, start to implement more public composting initiatives. We're hoping that our product can help with the transition for citizens who are partaking in that program. Um, so we're really hoping that this is going to create a sort of groundswell um, and people who may not have wanted to compost in the past will say like, oh my God, this is so easy. You know, you just throw it in here. There's no smell. There's no germs. There's no fruit flies. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where we're going with this. But then we're also connecting um, with local sustainability offices. So pretty much every city in our country now has some sort of sustainability department. Um, so we're really trying to connect in there and see how our product can help their community transition to public composting. Um, and then, you know, we're starting just in the US and Canada, um, but globally, uh, public composting initiatives are, you know, they're all over the place. Um, Europe and Asia especially have huge public composting programs. Um, so we're hoping to be able to, again, make that easier, hassle-free. Um, and then in terms of, uh, for us, another important public issue related to pedal is sanitation. Um, so there are tons of places in the world um, and even in our own country, like for instance, if we have a catastrophe and you put up a disaster relief shelter somewhere, we've seen that um, you know, those shelters have issues and cleanliness and sanitation is one of those things. Um, the same is you know, true of refugee camps. Um, other, other places that are housing people in close quarters um, and the spread of infection is a concern. Um, so that's kind of you know, the direction we're going in. And we only, you know, two days ago was our launch. So we are slowly, we're starting to see, you know, 
um, we're starting to see some success, but uh, we we have a little ways to go before we can start some of those larger initiatives. Yeah, um, and Andrew, um, I wanted to ask you as well, you talked about, you know, people are staying home more and that's obviously, you know, brought more users to plant tag. I guess, are there any other trends that you're kind of seeing, you know, either from the pandemic or just in general that are kind of affecting plant tags growth? Well, the trend in people doing more at home gardening is huge. Um, you know, there's there's sub facets of that that, that have shown um, you know, more interest than others, like vegetable gardening is, is massive right now. Um, the, the independent garden centers are having a hard time keeping uh, vegetable related plants and, uh, and fruits as well in stock. And, you know, so it's, as, as that being what it is, it's important for us to make sure that our content adapts to, you know, where people show interest. Um, you know, but beyond that, I think I mean, there's 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 been a movement towards green. I think that this has accelerated people's interest in healthy living. Um, you know, I live by White Rock Lake, and so it's been really really neat to see so many people outside bicycling and you know the bike shops. I mean, this is unrelated to what we do, but the bike shops around here. If you want to, you, if you need a bike repair, good luck. You guys, we got to make an appointment. And so, but I, but I think at a holistic level, I mean, it just shows that. You know, this pandemic, you know, on the positive side has caused humans, you know, a lot of us to take a pause and, you know, connect more with friends and family where we can, albeit, you know, social distance in many situations, but to get reacquainted with things that are non-tech, you know, they're not, you know, about gaming or they're not about work or they're, you know, that, that are more outdoors related. And, and I think people are, are, are inspired by that. And so, you know, our our hope, and we'll only know when we're looking in arrears, is that these trends of, of people spending more time outdoors and, and specifically um, developing a, a love for gardening and planting, something that sticks as, you know, as, as things become what they will become that, you know, we won't even know. We won't know for, you know, a year or years sometimes. But, you know, I think the, the garden centers are, um, they're doing really well. Um, when you know their 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 business has been kind of flat for a lot of years um so this those are the, those are the things that are related and unrelated to our business yeah and i mean kind of going off of that you know obviously when you're launching a company leadership is is very important and so i think you might be one of the only people on this panel right now you're also the the founder at uh capo commerce so i guess how do you juggle you know, leading two businesses, launching a new one while also leading a an established business? So two things. Number one, sleep becomes optional. It's, uh, you know, startups are, they're, they're vicious monsters. They they have an appetite for for your time with, with no bottom to it. You know, they, they will consume as much as you will feed them. And it, and it requires that. I mean, you're, you know, in, in most cases for startups, you're blazing new trails and you're having to figure things out. So you're not, driving on paved roads, you're carving your way through the jungle. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. Um, the other thing I would say is that it, it is everything about the people you surround yourself with. So, you know, we've got a really phenomenal advisory board. One of the things that having done several of these startups I learned is um, build a really, really great advisory board of people that will challenge you and yet help you early. Because if you get the right people there, they'll they'll help you identify your blind spots before the blind spots kill you. And that the blind spots are the death of all startups. So advisory board, critical. Um, and then, you know, I've got a really phenomenal partner at Capo um, in uh, Mike Cover. And he, he and I have worked together professionally and, and uh, done, done business together for years and decided it made sense to to combine our efforts in, in other businesses that we, we both were involved in. And so, you know, we had track record, record together. And, um, you know, so if you've got business partners that, uh, you know, that are really phenomenal, it helps in, in the load and, and, and also a different perspective. You know, it's one person's perspective. It's very difficult to find your way. As all startups have to, they all have to pivot and adapt and change. You, you never end up finishing with what you start with. And so, you know, remaining open minded to opportunities that present that you never could have anticipated and doing something about them, you know, when they're when they're in front of you is, is pretty important.
well. But uh, you know, summary is it's uh, two startups at once is uh, it's, it's a challenge, but fun at the same time. Yeah, no, I I, I can uh, totally imagine and kind of speaking about uh, Stephen like. How have you kind of had to, or have you had to change your your kind of leadership style and, you know, due to kind of everything that's going on with the pandemic and everything else? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, I think, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, the the thing cool. for, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So the thing for me is really to evaluate what's important uh, that we really want to to focus on you know so i think when you go into an unexpected season that we're in right now you know that can you know sort of scatter your 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 attention to detail on what what we need to focus on in this in this situation because we're i'm in such a broad industry with real estate i mean it can go left and right and so you know you my leadership style has to really you know, really dive in and center in on what's important. One of the things I realized is that, you know, because of the shift of the, the housing market, you know, I'm starting to find a lot of uh, sellers that that started, that started to read these letters from the heart for the buyers. And so buyers, because right now you talk about maybe having eight to 10 offers on one property, and then you may have that one particular buyer that may have wrote a letter from the heart, you know, and really poured into how this is their first home. They get ready to to get married and they they started, you know, really pouring out. And and that typically resonates with sellers these days uh, because of the, the, the season that we're in. And so we made it a point that our platform is going to have, you know, buyers provide videos that they can really share to that particular homeowner about their level of interest into their home. And we add a component that we say, we wanna create this dream board where we wanna have buyers share their particular style of home to that seller so that seller can know that their style fits the actual home that they're trying to purchase, which is their home. And so we wanna be able to match that level of interest there where two people can share uh, their their commonalities, which is I have a house that looks exactly like your dream home, and so we want to be able to connect that those individuals together, and so we focus on that to create a way where we can help buyers stand out, not just from an offer to that seller, but how they can really make a connection and what that can ultimately lead to, and so we we really focused on what's important and one of those things uh within that 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 scope of of a profile we decided that we have to focus on that connection and make those particular buyers you know stand out which gives us the ability to to continue our efforts forward to make sure people have a winning situation when they add to our platform cool. For sure. Um, and uh, Christy, I wanted to ask you kind of the same question, especially since, um, you know, I think you guys just moved to the North Texas area a few months ago, correct? Yes, we did. Uh, now it's like five months ago, I think. Yeah. Um, so I guess like, how is it, you know, leading, launching a company while also, you know, kind of getting settled into a, a new region? Um, it was overwhelming for me. Um, my husband, David, who's also uh, one of our co-founders and our CEO, um, has a great capacity for, for doing stuff. Um, he does all kinds of, he, his, his to-do list is like this long and he gets through all of it in one day. Um, so we managed to get moved in and get our paintings and our mirrors hung. Um, and once we got that finished, like we put everything into that. We were like, okay, for these first three weeks, we're just going to unpack our boxes and get our, our house settled so we feel comfortable. Um, and then after that, we, we started to focus almost 
solely on pedal. Um, so it has been challenging, um, but we also are just so happy to be in North Texas. Um, we, we moved here from Ohio and um, for me, weather is really important. So the fact that it's sunny outside every day and I can go outside and um, you know work on my laptop or whatever, um, that's made a huge difference for us. Um, so, I mean, all in all, it's been, it's been tumultuous, but um, this has been such a positive move for us. And we, we chose Texas for all kinds of reasons, um, one of which is because um, it's so close to Mexico where we hope to do a lot of our manufacturing. Um, so for all types of reasons, this region has been really wonderful for us. Um, and it's been a lot to deal with, but uh, we feel, you know, super privileged to have this opportunity um, to be able to move to a new house and to be able to launch a startup. I mean, um, a, a lot of people don't get to do that. Uh, so we're, we're just thrilled. We're excited. We're a little nervous, um, but we're uh, all in all, we feel like we're in a good place. Yeah. Um... And I think you guys, uh, our other panelists, uh, their companies are largely self-funded. And I, I think you guys are one of the ones that has taken a little more in outside funding. And I guess, like, how do you feel that that has helped position you to kind of navigate through this pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's been incredibly helpful. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had our launch two days ago. And um, before the launch, we were able to raise some more money based on data that we have from our partners um, in terms of how well our um, online ads are doing and you know how many emails we have on on our list of interested people. Um, so that that was uh, that was huge for us because what we were really able to do is just put that money straight into advertising. Um, so we feel like we're in an excellent position, um, and we've we've also taken this opportunity. Um, to raise money from a very diverse pool of outside investors. Um, so it was really important to us um, that it wasn't just all white males who were gonna be you know, gaining money from this company's success. Um, so we, we were very intentional about looking for female investors and looking for people of color to invest. Um, and as a result, now we have this very diverse pool of investors who, you know, can give us perspectives from all different backgrounds. Um, so having that group of outside investors has been uh, just tremendous for us. Yeah, and I mean, I, I want to ask Andrew, Stephen, you guys kind of the same question, but um, I guess we'll start with Andrew. Uh, you know, you have kind of connections in the VC and startup ecosystem, but you guys are largely self-funded, if I remember correctly. So I guess, like, how is that kind of, do you feel like that's been an advantage or a disadvantage kind of navigating through this current crisis? Well, crisis aside, um, you know, having access to capital is oxygen for startups. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a good moment in time when it makes sense to raise outside funding and having raised, you know, money for several of my startups in the past early um, and then throughout the journey, when you when you raise money from investors, it, it introduces um, a new commitment to, to keep the investors apprised of what's going on. Um, you know, it's very important to choose the right investors, too, because just choosing money will, again, startups need oxygen to run, um, oxygen being money, um, having investors that really don't get your vision or can distract you from where you believe the company should go, which isn't always, you know, that's not always a bad thing. It's always good to have people that challenge where you are and where you're going and why you're heading in that direction. But they can, they can also be a, you know, a, a burden to deal with. And so, um, you know, it, it could we have gone faster than we have if we had outside funding? Absolutely. But, you know, we're, we're inventing a platform right now that's never been created before. Our relationship with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Jerry Moore, the, the, the guy that runs their plants database, really underscored the opportunity that I felt existed. And he, he told me that after years and years and millions, tens of millions in government funding, they could not... Uh, accomplish localizing plant care. It is a huge initiative that required a lot of data science and um, uh, just a tremendous amount of work. And so, 
you know, taking taking money from investors too early, while it, you know, it takes a lot of smart people involved to help us get the algorithms right and you know, image recognition right and all the things that we do. But you know, having the ability to to figure that out on our own and prove out the business model in a in an early generation and then go to investors and say, hey, this isn't this isn't just a crazy idea, you know, with you know, with no proof of proof of, you know, no use cases, no proof of concept, no customer, no nothing, you know, those things, especially in technology, are have proven to be hard to fund and balance. Um, I think there are other parts of the country that are a lot more um, amenable to uh, really getting behind a, a technology idea early. Dallas, it, it needs a little bit more proven out, a little bit more traction. And so I was, you know, really um, happy that we had the ability to prove this out um, as we have over a period of time. Um, but that said, you know, we, you know, we will be raising a round of funding because, you know, money is, is oxygen, but it's also velocity and speed too. So it'll happen. It, it definitely helps to kind of uh, keep a business going for sure. Uh, and Stephen, I, I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on the, on the subject as well. I know y'all are largely uh, bootstrapped. So I guess like, how, how do you kind of see that as either an advantage or disadvantage to home match X? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, been, been bootstrapping this from, from an MVP perspective last year. And, uh, you know, of course I, I do real estate, I sell real estate. And so I have to, you know, keep grinding in real estate sales in order to, to fund and bootstrap the business. I think what that has presented is the ability to, to continue to to go after in real estate, understand and study the market even more, and then realize how much I can pour into the platform in ways that if I didn't understand the real estate in a certain level, a certain capacity, I may not have been able to be wise in some of the decisions that I uh, that I have been making over time. And because of that, I think it really allowed us to to look at the market and take a step back and realize, okay. You know, let's put money in areas that we know we can sh we can get the value out of it. And we know that the industry really shifted in a way where buyers are having agents are having to to really market their buyers. You know, it's no longer just marketing real estate. You're marketing buyers because buyers can't find properties. And because of that, I say, wow, this is an interesting uh, component here. And so what what we've been able to share is how real estate agents can you know, provide their buyers and, and create their profiles on our platform. They can use our platform as a way to market their buyers to other real estate agents and sellers. And so we, we, we realize how we have to, you know, when we, when we sell, when we just sell funding, we have to be creative and, uh, and how aggressive we need to be into the real estate market. And we've been having several calls with uh, some venture capitalists about you know looking at our company as an interesting uh you know a unique value proposition to their portfolio um but one of the things that really stood out is i remember one particular call an individual said well what can you do with real estate agents where we're not necessarily uh we making it more valuable than than trying to extinct them because we know that in real estate you have a lot of disrupting companies that want to take you know food away from agents tables and so because of that, I said, well, I'm, I'm a real estate agent and I know that I have value in what there's value in what I do. And I know that for me, it's important that I keep real estate agents relevant. And because of that, I want to bring more money to the agent's pockets than ever before, which is what 3% of the real estate market has right now is buyers and sellers connect together without ever hitting the real estate market. And that's 3% of the of the over two million transactions that happened last year and because of that i said wow that's a that's a really strong that's 160 thousand transactions that happened that nobody really knows about you know and so because of that i said well people only need specific things for real estate agents i need you to write a contract i need you to 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 put together this portfolio for my investment to determine you know is this a good strategy and that's and they pay they pay good money to to be to to go down that path, and because of that, it's important that I said well we have to bootstrap it in a way 
well, we need to build a component to give agents a leg up and for them to be to do more business from their computer without having to do an open house, without having to, you know, show their client five houses in one in one day. You know, how can we take how can we keep them in their in front of their computers where they can do more business at home than business outside in the streets? Yeah, and, and kind of talking about building things, um, I, I want to ask all of you guys this question, but uh, we'll leave it here for right now, Stephen. Um, what are kind of the plans for growing HomeMatchX and how do you plan on uh, achieving that? Yeah, so the model that we're introducing within the platform is adding value to the realty card, for home, which is part of HomeMatchX. And because of that, it's I like to say it's more it has a, a legal zoom upwards component where you provide the service and you then those funds are escrowed and held to the to the job is complete. And so we having to pivot and you know look at that as a as a uh, as a money making opportunity for the for the company, we 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 looking at that as an as an avenue that we can draw more interest from more real estate agents more venture capitalists say wow i've never heard of this particular model being driven in this way so focusing in on this particular model which which adds value to everything that we built within the platform this is another layer that we really could become more of a service operations for real estate agents where it's almost like referring business out but you're referring guaranteed business with funds and waiting until that job is performed. So I like to call it that legal zoom with an upwards component, but for real estate agents. Yeah, and uh, Christy, I mean, you guys, uh, you know, launched the pre-sales like very recently. So I guess, um, where where do you plan on taking Pedal and, and how are you planning on getting there? Yeah, so, you know, we are pursuing multiple paths at once. We have the pre-sale event going on right now at pedalclean.com, um, but we are also pursuing channel sales and enterprise sales. Um, so, you know, for uh, enterprise sales, for instance, you know, we would really be looking at um, like daycare centers, you know, kinder care, these large um, chains. Um, and if we can get to them and talk to them about the benefits of not having the odor of stinking diapers permeating throughout their daycare centers, um, we can potentially make a large sale that way. Um, so channel sales and enterprise sales. Um, and you know, we've been talking to a lot of um, government-based um, companies, companies that do sales to government agencies. Um, and we're finding that there are a lot of uses for this for um, our frontline uh, responders and fighters, um, you know, discarding of medical waste in a way that is germ-free and sanitary, um, but then also things like, you know, being able to um, house blood plasma. Um, you know, somebody goes out into the field and they save somebody from a burning building and they slash their arm and now they need blood. Um, well, you know, our unit can be able to house that blood at a safe temperature um, right in the truck for them. Um, so we're really looking at different types of use cases um, and we're looking at more outdoor ruggedized versions. Um, because, you know, right now uh, we have to start somewhere. Um, and what we have is a five gallon residential unit. You could use it in your garage if your garage is insulated, um, but it's not for outdoor use. So right now we're working on a design for a larger, more rugged outdoor unit um, so that people can continue the cycle, right? If you freeze your garbage inside, um, but then you dump it into your outdoor bin, eventually it's going to thaw, which is okay because it's outside. Um, but we'd like to be able to continue that whole process right to the curb. Um, like for instance, in, in Vermont, where they have instituted a public composting program, they're getting all these reports of bears breaking into people's homes because of the increase in organic waste that people are keeping. Um, or if you think about like, you know, a campsite, um, they're always saying, you know, you, you have to keep your food contained, the bears will smell it, they will come. Um, so we're really trying to think about, you know, all the different use cases for this and then 
how to package this in a way that's going to be energy efficient. Um, you know, right now, PETO only uses eight kilowatt hours um, per month, which is less than a dollar of energy per month. Um, and so we want to make sure that as we grow larger, um, we're maintaining that efficiency um, and improving on it uh, if possible. So we're really, we're, 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 we're trying to to do everything. Um, we don't want to rely solely on the success of the pre-sale. Um, it looks like it's going to be successful, but uh, we're not stopping there. So we're, we're just pursuing as many paths as we can. Yeah, nobody nobody really wants bears. That's a, it's generally a bad infestation yeah. to have. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Andrew, I wanted to ask you the same question. I know you guys have uh, rolled out a new feature. I, I have the Plant Tag app, and uh, I got the uh, the photo picture thing. Although it keeps telling me that my olive tree is a rosemary, which I'm pretty sure it's not. But uh, <laughs> but I guess what are uh, you know like you guys are rolling out new features. I guess like what is kind of the plan for growing Plant Tag, um, and how are you planning on getting there? Yeah, that's a that's a actually a good segue into talking about the, the challenge. Is that plants have basically seven cycles of life. You've got um, a sapling, a juvenile, an adult, a flowering, a fruiting, a diseased, and a dying. So if you consider those cycles of life, and then you consider the fact that each of those, each a single species of plant is gonna look different depending upon the geography that it, that it grows in. They're gonna be, they're all gonna look a little different. Being able to identify a single species or, you know, across the country is tough. Um, you know, it took us, you know, about, I think it took us five months to build our image recognition system. Um, and so it's a perpetual process of continuing to train that, to train that part of our, our technology to do a better and better and better job of identifying things like olive trees and rosemary and, um, you know, because, of, you know, the, the, the pixels on an image can look very similar. So how does this translate into where we're going in the future? I and mean, we've got a development queue that's pretty deep doing some really neat stuff around um, augmented reality the ability to drag and drop plants on your existing home choose um, different templates and styles when you know so you can kind of do some basic landscaping and visualize how certain plants would look and then look forward for one two and three years to figure out how fast they grow based on uh, conditions like sunlight soil and ph depending upon exactly where you live so, I mean, you can kind of do the math on how many different attributes uh, come into play there. But um, we we launched the technology locally because we had ready access to a repository and database of, of plants that were specific to our backyard. And our goal was make sure that we can do a really, really good job of helping people care for plants in Dallas. And from there, we, we've grown our, our, our radius um, regionally. So right now we're... Um, we're entering markets uh, throughout Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas. Um, but the challenge that we've got in growing our business is that 50% of all the plants that people buy are purchased in the spring. So, you know, it's the ultimate in a seasonal business. And so what, we, what we're doing right now is we're contemplating an expansion into South Florida and, and uh, Southern California, where the impact of winter doesn't cause people to, you know, to, uh, to pay for their planting. Um, and as we enter these markets, you know, we've, we've got to adapt and grow our, our plant repository to support those plants that are indigenous to the geographies that we have. Um, you know, currently for the foreseeable future, we're really focused on uh, our ability to do a great job domestically here. But, I mean, plants are global. And, you know, I've, I've never been involved in a business where the addressable market is virtually every human on the planet that has some affinity or involvement with, you know, lawns and shrubs and trees. And, you know, even if you live in, in multifamily apartments and things of that nature, you got houseplants that, you know, people people regularly kill houseplants and, you know, they could use a little nudge and a little guidance um, to, to help them with the, the attributes of a specific, specific species um, and making sure that it doesn't die and it flourishes. And I can tell you that I'm, you know, I've killed plants all my life. My wife kills plants. and you know, so we're, you know, we're good use cases of why is this technology necessary? It's difficult. I mean, have a conversation with anybody I know and, and tell them what we're doing. The first thing they said is, I kill plants. This is going to be awesome. So, 
Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a journey to continue to make the data better, to find, you know, different unique data sources, some of which are geographically specific. Um, you know, some will go, you know, real deep on things like, you know, trees and perennials that have a really, really long lifespan. And you know, things like annuals, you want to make sure that you get the most out of an annual, but that gets replaced. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a big job to make sure that the data is accurate and yet geographically specific. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm definitely a, a plant serial killer, actually, like right outside my window here. I'm looking at plants. <laughs> Hopefully we can help. I'll go, I'll go make sure that, you, yeah, actually, if you try to scan your olive trees, I just added about 400 pictures of olive trees in the last uh, two or three weeks. So I, I think the performance should be better. I'll, I'll have to check that. I mean, it's only about a year old, so it's got some small leaves yeah. that might be why. Uh, it definitely got the uh, spider lilies on the side of my house. Like, oh man, those, so. yeah, those yeah, are cool. yeah, the, the learning journey for me is just learning about all the differences in species of plants. Has been a lot of fun. You know, if you, if you I, I got you know an appetite for learning new things, and um, yeah, there's 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 no bottom to learning about new plants in your neighborhood and those those spider lilies they come from nowhere and they're, they're stuck yeah they just uh popped up like in my driveway and then i realized that like they sell for like 12 bucks at the store so uh, yeah. my new startup over here is if uh spider lilies <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah they're, nice. they're pretty cool <laughs> um, yeah yeah they're really pretty um, and I, we're kind of running low on time here, but um, I wanted to ask, you know, all of uh, all of your startups kind of fit into, you know, trends that are kind of going on in people's homes right now as people are kind of, you know, sheltering in place and stuff like that. So I wanted to ask, I'm kind of curious, what kind of home trend or, you know, just kind of current trend have you been participating in? Obviously, I've kind of shared mine. Mine is gardening. Not great at it, but uh We've got some uh, leeks and some herbs going outside, so that's been my my trend. But I'm curious as to uh, what y'all's is, and uh, I guess we can just kind of uh, go around here. Christy, uh, what have uh, what have what trend have you been participating in recently? Uh, well, similarly to you, Kevin, and to Andrew's, you know, opening point, I'm obsessed with gardening. Um, I'm not not doing vegetables, but I am absolutely obsessed with succulents. Um, so I've been planting succulents like a mad woman all around our backyard in the front of our house. And now I'm like propagating them and trying to get different kinds. Um, so I will definitely be a, a user for your app um, because like everyone else, I'm, I'm killing a lot of them in the process uh, as I learn. Um, so for me, that's been huge. And then I've also been doing more um, cooking, like trying different recipes and things like that, um, things that I wouldn't have tried otherwise. Um, so I think things that are sort of in line with the the popular trends that we're seeing. Yeah. What is what is your your crowning cooking achievement so far? Oh. Oh my God, that's a good question. I recently discovered that I love pork chops um, because when I was a kid. Um, my mom's not watching, so I can say this, but she would always dry out the pork chops and like you would have to put on all this applesauce and stuff. And it was just kind of like not my favorite thing. Um, but then I recently found these amazing uh, recipes for pork chops in the New York Times recipe section. And now I'm like the pork chop queen. So I'm now I'm like succulent queen and the pork chop queen. And I have coronavirus to thank for it. Hey, those are two pretty good titles. Um, Andrew, what, what about you? What, have, what trends have you been hopping on? So, Christy, if you're having problems with your succulents, chances are you're overwatering. Yes. I'll just, I'll just add that. Succulents I'm overwatering, are... I'm underwatering, I'm doing it all wrong. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, this is, a, this is a kind of an interesting question. Um, I have always wanted to own a honey beehive. And I decided at the end of last year that I was going to finally do it. And there's a guy in my neighborhood who's got a couple of hives who I met and agreed to vet for me. And so January, I was committed. I bought my hive and I got all prepared and I took possession of my bees in, uh, in April. And so it is, that has been a really fascinating learning journey. So I've got a great hive. I had an excellent harvest in the spring. I've learned a lot about the, you know, the, the structure and the, and the life cycle of, of honeybees and, 
Yeah, they're 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 really a lot of fun. I really like that lot. Yeah, and uh, Stephen, what about you? Yeah, well, uh, recently moved uh, to a new home in uh, June, actually. So I've been doing a lot of projects uh, at the house. Uh, so some of the projects really is how tedious putting knobs on all the cabinets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I signed up for that. And, you know, I didn't request that I have the holes pre-drilled. So I had to go through that whole process. And so it, that's been fun. So just a little projects around the house that I've been uh, diving into uh, recently. And, you know, the next one is, is once I, since I finished the kitchen cabinets, now I just have to go to the bathroom. So, you know, I'm taking, I'm debriefing right now because that's a lot, that's a lot of work. You're getting there. I actually just moved into a house about four months ago and my cabinets are about halfway painted right now. So uh, my kitchen looks a little odd right now. <laughs> so um, before we, we kind of sign off here, I wanted to make sure we got to any Q&As. Um, and actually, I had a probably one that we definitely want to address. Uh, Andrew, uh, someone is asking, your app is not uh, on the store, so where can people find your app and download it? Great question. It's a web app. So we chose when we set out to develop this not to actually build uh, an app that you would download to the normal app stores. Um, but if you text plants to 46376, um, it'll respond with a, a text link. You click on the link, there's a wizard to download it, um, and it adds an icon to your desktop. And it, it, it behaves exactly like the mobile app, but it's a, a lot more lightweight. There's no login and password because it's native to your phone. We understand your mobile ID, uh, which credentials you, and make sure that your yard is secure. Um, but again, text uh, plants to 46376. That's on our website too, if uh, you forget that. And I think you'll find being in technology, you're yeah. gonna find a trend towards people doing more uh, what's called progressive web apps um, and not uh, you know, the heavy apps that you gotta download and update and you know they, they end up in the app graveyard. Yeah, and uh, can you briefly, uh, why, why do you think that is? Well, I think people are at fatigue, number one. Number two, from a technical perspective, it's very, very expensive to maintain successfully both an Android and an iOS version of an app because um, they end up becoming very hardware specific and they're difficult for developers to deal with all the idiosyncrasies that exist on a phone. Everybody's phone is unique based on what they installed on the phone and it makes oftentimes apps unstable. Um, the nice thing about using web code is it's it's multi-screen, it's responsive, uh, the same code that runs on you know my iPhone or on any Android device, any tablet, it'll run on my PC. So it's it's built once, deployed any screen, much more efficient. And the other nice thing about it is is any uh, patches, fixes, updates, or anything that I do to our code base is immediately available. Versus if you build um, a fat mobile app, you got to deploy it to uh, Apple has got to go through the review process and maybe it gets kicked back and they're always changing the rules and it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, there, there was a time where that was the only way to get mobile technology and a mobile device, but those, those days are numbered. Yeah, um, and it looks like we just have a little bit of time. Uh, Chrissy, uh, just real quick, um, you guys are doing pre-orders. Um, when, when are people going to start uh, receiving pedals at their house? Yeah, so we actually just recently inked a really amazing deal with Danby Appliances uh, out of Canada. They're one of the largest manufacturers of appliances in uh, North America. Um, so uh, that's given, um, I think, our, given our customers a lot more confidence that we're going to be able to deliver. Um, because I think a lot of times with uh, crowdfunding pre-sale events, there's some uncertainty around that. Um, but right now, uh, with that partnership in place, we're looking at um, very early spring 2021. Um, so probably like a March, March-ish time frame for delivery. Awesome. Well, and I'm uh, I'm getting the note here that we are out of time. So um, real quick, I wanted to say thank you guys so much for uh, joining us in our panel. This has been an awesome discussion um, and good luck with uh, uh, with your companies. And also thank you guys who are tuning in virtually. We appreciate it. And um, again, one last thank you to our uh, founding
adventure. Thompson Reuters and BDO. Uh, and thank you guys so much. Thank you guys all for tuning in. And I uh, hope to see you guys at our next event. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yes.